Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my May 2020 reading wrap-up. Let's go. Alright guys, just the one book to wrap you up on today, and that is The Armageddon Rag by George R.R. R. Martin. He is obviously the author of Game of Thrones. This is, um... I know it's actually got a lot in common with my current work in progress. My current work is about, uh, it's a cross between like Spinal Tap and Lord of the Rings and follows a band. And this is kind of similar in that it follows a band. They're called the Nazgul. You can obviously see his fantasy influences coming through here. Um, but yeah, this, this band, basically their lead singer gets shot and they're thinking about getting back together, but some weird murders are going on. The main character's are sort of a music journalist who's investigating them. It was pretty well done. Towards the end, it did lose a little bit of steam, but overall, I did enjoy it. Uh, I gave it a four out of five. Reminded me of Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill, um, and in like a good way as well, because I did like that book. And overall, um, yeah, I was pretty impressed with it. And I, I also thought Martin did quite a good job of, like, creating this fictional band. Like, you start to feel as though their songs are real songs and stuff. So, yeah, good stuff. So, today I've got a couple of books for you. So, the first one here is The Untapped Woman by Abigail Morley. This is a collection of poetry. I know Abigail because uh, we were both invited on a press trip to Latvia together about 2018 now. I'll link below to the vlog I did while I was there. Um, she also runs a website called The Poetry Shed. And she reached out to me to ask if I would be willing to review her collection of poetry. So I said yes. Um, to be honest, the subject matter isn't necessarily something I'd normally read. It's because a lot of it's about you know femininity and motherhood. But I also think that a good writer can make you care about those topics through the way that they write. And Morley definitely does that here. I'm going to read a couple of poems at random for you from this and then give you my rating, I guess. Where you used to be. Your shape is here again, slides into your chair, as if every night you're fastened to cushions. Stripping feathers from your wings like silence, I flick the TV, channel by channel, until shadows reveal how you launch for flight, but never leave, each skinned wing aloft with nowhere to go. When I go, I'll unmap myself from this world, tug pins like stitches, watch them stretch and snap. Let's do one more, let's do ultrasound. Today my face revolves to a full moon on the scan. You stroke the weight of me and I know you need two hands now just to gather me in. I sense the thrum of your voice oscillate through muscle and roar like a river at its mouth ready for the swell. I want you to hear me. I don't yet know there's only two months left with you. I don't know it is not a love that lasts a lifetime or a shared one. I hear that voice of yours in my underworld through all your sleepless nights and don't know that all the things you say aren't just to me. I don't yet know, nuzzled here in the very centre of you, that I won't hear your voice on the other side. So yeah, all in all, very powerful poetry. I gave it a 3.75, maybe a 4 out of 5, and I did do a full review of it as well. And then I read A Clergyman's Daughter, which uh, there are some really interesting bits, because it basically just follows this life of this normal sort of working class woman, basically from, you know, 1930 or whatever. Uh, she ends up working at a school, and she kind of revitalizes the lessons a bit because they were just learning from rote and they were getting the kids to copy things out from the board and stuff like this and practicing handwriting and memorizing the you know state capitals or whatever and um yeah she started doing like a more what we would probably say a more modern style of teaching possibly even more modern than what we're doing now it's more like montessori teaching basically but she was trying to get the kids to fall in love with learning and to actually teach them things and uh, yeah, it was really well written. The clergy in general isn't my, my favourite kind of subject matter because I'm not religious. But that only was part of the story. In general, Orwell's a great writer and uh, his non-fiction is always fascinating to read. And I did enjoy this. I gave it a 3.75 slash 4 out of 5 again. We'll call it a 4 out of 5 for this one. And again, full review coming. Alright, I've got two books to update you on today. The first of these I don't actually have a physical copy of anymore, and that is Persuasion by Jane Austen. So I did this as a reread uh, via audiobook for Rereadathon. I actually first read it sort of late last year and really didn't like it at all, but um, I read it as a bedtime book in kind of fits and starts, whereas this time I had the audiobook um, and I listened to it over the space of like 24 hours or so. And um, the reader was pretty good. It was just a, like a LibriVox free audio book, um, just like a regular person reading it. But she was actually pretty good. Like she was putting a lot of effort into the voices and the characters and stuff. So I thought that was quite cool. Um, overall, it made me a lot more engaged in the story. I still don't particularly care for the actual storyline itself, but the writing I think stood out a lot more for me, at least on this read. Got lots of great quotes and stuff. Full review coming soon, and I bumped it up from a one star to a three star out of five. So there we go. 
And then I also read Three Blind Mice by Agatha Christie. Now, the title story of this is what the mouse trap is based on, and I've seen the mouse trap, so I kind of knew what was happening there. And then it turns out I've already read all of the other stories in this collection, so there wasn't really anything new or surprising for me there. Uh, part of that, I think, is because basically I've added every Agatha Christie book to my wish list, and there's some overlap between British and American editions where like, they had different titles and published different short stories within them. But if you read both of them, there's a lot of overlap and stuff. But yeah, I did enjoy it. There's both Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple in this. So there's that to enjoy. Not a bad place to start, really, if you're new to Christie and you see this knocking around. I gave it a 4 out of 5 and would recommend. Okay, guys, just the one book to update you on today. And that is The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. This is a memoir of his childhood growing up in America. To be honest, I couldn't relate to it as well because of that. Because obviously it's so different to my own childhood. But it was very well written, very humorous throughout. I didn't enjoy it as much as I generally enjoy his travel writing, but still Bill Bryson is just generally a fun author to read and I'm definitely glad that I picked it up. And I would probably give it like a 3.75, maybe if I'm being generous, a 4 out of 5. And it is probably quite a good one if, um, you know, if you're stuck in lockdown and you want to think about when times were simpler. Although he does talk about things like, you know, the Cold War and missile drills and stuff because that was a part of his childhood too so it's kind of interesting because of that but yeah all right guys just two books to update you on today the first of them is Fait d'hiver number two numero deux by par nucléca elle est un écriteur français et uh, je l'aime je l'aime je l'aime oui um, yeah, my my ex girlfriend who was French um, got me the, or gave me the first book of Fade Diver that she worked that she wrote, and um, as I'm still learning French, I thought I'd pick this up as well. Basically, it takes like newspaper headlines and then she turns them into cartoons. So, for example, here, une fille distribue dans des somnifères à la place de bonbon et ses camarades d'école. So, a girl gave out sleeping tablets instead of sweets to her school friends, and you get this little thing. Uh, overall, yeah, very humorous, enjoyable. I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5. Uh, the previous one had a lot more of these like individual ones. So here we have Un tour de magie turned mal en direct à la télévision. So a magic show went wrong <laughs> live on television. Um, but like a lot of the ones in this one have got loads of pages. This is actually Pourquoi Brad et Angelina ont il manqué le mari? This one here is uh, Pourquoi Brad et Angelina ont il manqué le mariage de George Clooney? So that's why Brad and Angelina uh, missed the marriage of George Clooney. And then I read The Primrose Path, uh, the first novel by Bram Stoker. This was actually initially serialised when it was first published. Uh, and this also has got as well Buried Treasures. I would actually say The Primrose Path is a novella and Buried Treasures is a short story. But they're both quite cool. They investigate a lot of the same themes that are in Dracula. And in many ways, especially if you read the uh, introductory essay, it's quite like prescient of uh, Stoker's life, which is quite cool. Uh, it's not amazing, but there are like plenty of things to talk about. As you can see, I've tabbed a few things out, so I'll be doing a fuller review there. And uh, considering he wrote it when he was like 27, it's not bad at all. Uh, I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5. Um, yeah. I'll give, I'm just going to give you the two blurbs from these. I think that's easier than me trying to explain what they're about. So the Primrose Path we have. Jerry O'Sullivan is a Dublin theatrical carpenter. He hankers after life in London and persuades his wife to uproot with their three young children. In London, he falls in with Mephistopheles and a cast of dubious characters. And before long, he and his family are enmeshed in tragedy. And then for buried treasures, Robert Hamilton seeks the hand of Ellen, but lacks the financial means. He dreams of finding sunken treasure and enlists his friend Tom to help turn dream into reality. But storms are brewing. Alright guys, so I read uh, Yertle the Turtle and Other Stories by Dr. Seuss. Let me just tell you which stories are in here if we've got an index. We don't have an index, that's really inconvenient. Um, I could flick through. Where are the title pages? Who knows? The Big Brag. And this one with the feather tail. Gertrude McFuzz. So uh, yeah, those are the three stories in this. Did quite enjoy it. I never read Dr. Seuss as a kid, so I'm kind of making up for it as an adult. But um, it's fun to read and to see how far the influence of it has spread, you know. Uh, overall, I'd probably give it like a 3.75 out of 5. I would say definitely if you have kids um, who, are in, who appreciate the surreal, then this, this might be a good book to read for them. Um, yeah, I'm glad I got to it and we'll be reading more Dr. Seuss soon. I, I don't really have much more to say to it.
I, I mean, I normally don't like rhyming poetry, but when it's absurdist children's rhyming poetry, I'm, I'm down. Alrighty, I've also finally finished reading The Wind Up Bird Chronicle uh, by Haruki Murakami. I started reading this as a buddy read with Charlie from Charlie Heathcote. Uh, we, we started by reading one chapter a day, then moved up to two, then moved up to three. And then Charlie just sort of raced off and finished it, so then I caught up. But um, I think we both enjoyed it, uh, particularly for me, the scenes that really stood out. There was the scene where uh, the peeling of the peach, uh, which is like a euphemism for something else. Also, a lot of the scenes in the wells, those were quite sort of brutal and memorable as well. There's a lot of stuff here, investigating things like war, like anonymity. It's first published in the mid-90s. So, like, there was one bit with a, uh, uh, like, somebody's having a conversation over a computer and they're like, well, if only we could see them to make sure that they are who they say they are. And I'm there, like, I mean, like, with a webcam. But, um, I mean, they had webcams in 1995 as well, so I'm just like, but anyway. Uh, overall, yeah, very well written, very engaging story. Even though this was 600 odd pages long, it still held my attention throughout. I will say I enjoyed the first half more than the second half. Um, but only because I think the first half did such a good job of setting it all up that then it was it was a hard act for it to then follow with the second half and the, the conclusion of it. But overall, really enjoyed this one. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. I don't want to say too much more because a full review of this will be coming soon, which I think is going to be about 20 minutes long. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And then I read Silas Marner by George Eliot. So as you can see, this is like a super old edition that I've got. I wonder when it was published, actually. There's no publishing information on this thing so I don't know but yeah I basically picked this up because I've never read any George Eliot before and my friend Dave um, has actually written a musical based on this novel so I wanted to finally read it what's interesting is that it's part one for about 80% of the novel and then it just jumps to part two at the end and um, I guess the end ending I wasn't particularly keen on but the Bits surrounding this jump between part one and part two. The ending of part one and the start of part two. Probably my highlights of the book. Um, mainly because that's where you see the most of Marner's character development. I mean, he's basically a bit of a miser who kind of, by the end of the book, he's quite a different character, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't want to say too much about it. I mean, to be honest, because I read this as a bedtime book, uh, I read it over the space of like a month, doing like ten pages at a time or something. So... It's one of those books where I've now been left with more of, um, what would you call it, like more of an impression of what it was about and more of like a sense of the way it made me feel and the way that I am imagined some of the different places and the characters, um, whereas the plot itself, because it was quite a slow burner, not so much, not so memorable, but the characters definitely, like uh, Mana, I can't remember his daughter's name, was it Ellie or something like that? Ep Epi, I was close. Um, I quite like her, she's pretty She's pretty cool as well But yeah, overall, I mean, I gave it like 3 out of 5 I can't really give it any higher or lower than that It's a classic, so they're quite hard to rate um, But it's just not m my particular type of classic, I guess And um, yeah, I did really only read it Just for the sake of having read it Rather than because I was particularly interested in, in, in the subject matter But uh, yeah, I ticked it off So there's there's that Alright guys, just one book to update you on, and that is The Pale Horse by Agatha Christie. Uh, this doesn't have Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple in it, but it does make up for it because instead it's got, um, what's her name, uh, Ariadne Oliver, the detective novelist. And um, she's always interesting because through her, Christie's able to share some of her own observations on writing and stuff, which is always cool. And um, yeah, overall I did enjoy it, a uh, pretty good little murder mystery. It plays in a similar way to how um, Christie's played in the past with like nursery rhymes and stuff, and there's also this little, this little, just this little hint of occultism, occultism and the uh, supernatural as well. Um, but overall, I mean, if you're new to Christie, probably start with one of her, you know, more well-known books. Um, but if you are ready to start exploring her back catalogue, it's not a bad little one to go for. You have like a 3.5, maybe 3.75 out of five. Alright, just got a couple of books to update you on. The first one I've actually already taken through, so I can't show you, but it is called um, Tuesday by Neil Gaiman, and it's a children's book about a panda that can't stop sneezing, basically. The only problem is, like, that's the full story. I mean, there was no twist or anything to it, no moral or resolution, really. The panda just, when it sneezes, it causes a lot of problems, and it goes out, almost sneezes, doesn't sneeze, then does sneeze, the end. You, you don't need to read it now. So I gave it like a 3 out of 5. I did think the illustrations are really good. 
can't you smell? You smell of the poo you just did. But, um, and there were some Easter eggs in the illustrations as well, but other than that, meh. Then I read Time of Contempt by Andrei Sapkowski, so this is Witcher book number four. It's the second novel. And I've got to be honest, my critiques for the Witcher books are still the same that my fear was to begin with, which is that he's just a better short story writer than a novelist, I find. I think what I like about the shorter stories is each one... Like, the Witcher books are great at investigating different kinds of, like, morality questions and stuff. And, um, yeah, I just think in the short story collections, there's space for him to ask more of those questions, you know? So, um, yeah, there's just, I think, less on offer in the novels. I mean, it was still okay. The other problem is that they also just feel like constant build-up. Like, there's all this build-up for this war that's apparently going to happen. And, like, it's not happening. <laughs> And I think I'm running out of books now. I think there aren't many left after this one. So I don't know how the series rounds out or whether there's another book coming or anything like that. Um, but yeah, overall, it was all right. I gave it 3.5 out of 5. So far, I would say my experience of The Witcher books has been it's, it's a very okay series. Um, and personally, I would probably just say, probably just read the short story collections and have done with it, at least unless the novels get any better. But yeah. All right, guys, just the one book to update you on today, and that is Charlotte Street by Danny Wallace. This is kind of... I would call it like a contemporary novel. Uh, it's got a little bit in common with like rom-coms and stuff. Um, Danny Wallace is actually kind of a journalist by trade, um, kind of a comedian here and there. He's written some non-fiction before. He wrote the book Yes Man, uh, where he just uh, said yes to every invite that he got to everything. So um, yeah, he's done a few bits and bobs here and there. Uh, so I've read most of his stuff before, but this is his first novel and so, um, I wasn't too sure what to expect from it. And actually, I've been putting it off for a while for some reason. I'm not sure why. I've had it for like four years. Finally read it. I did enjoy it. I would give it a four out of five. In terms of the plot, it basically follows um, somebody who... Um, he kind of has this like crush on this woman from afar. And then she leaves a disposable camera behind. And he develops the films and tries to, to try and track her down. So, um, yeah, as it says on the front, a heartwarming everyday tale of boy stalks girl. I would recommend this one. So i got one more book to update you guys on, and that is Haunted by Chuck Palahniuk. Um, this is basically like a short story collection. It does also have some uh, free verse poetry in it. Um, and the, the kind of theme here is a bunch of writers have uh, answered this advertisement for a writing retreat. And this is kind of what they come up with as they're there. But they end up stranded, um, and like people are eating each other and stuff. And obviously it's uh, Paulinic, so it's like pretty brutal. For example, there's a story called Guts in this, and then he has like an um, outro essay towards the end where he talks about it. And he says apparently when he used to do readings of this at events, like people used to pass out. Um, I didn't think it was that bad actually, like even just reading that. I mean, I thought it was good. Don't get me wrong, I thought it was good, but I, like I wouldn't have thought anything unusual of it. It's just, you know, it reminds me of a lot of like bizarre fiction and stuff like that. So. It's fine. I mean, maybe if you're squeamish, don't read it. But um, there's also a reading of it on uh, on uh, YouTube that you can listen to for free. Uh, so maybe check that out. But uh, overall, yeah, Haunted, Chuck Paul and it. I did enjoy this. I gave it a 4.25 out of 5. I thought it was pretty solid. This was published in 1998 and set in 1997. And uh, it basically follows this kind of slightly unhinged kid whose mum was a film actress who apparently committed suicide and uh, he gets pretty dark basically. It's one of those weird things where it's like a thriller where you follow the bad guy right from the start so you know who did it. You're just kind of waiting for them to be caught and I thought that added quite a cool element to it. Um, yeah, it was quite dark in places. Like there were some pretty brutal scenes to be honest. Um, overall, I was pretty impressed with it because I've, I've read like most of Peter James's crime novels, his Roy Grace books, um, but a lot of his standalones I found to be kind of hit and miss and um, yeah, I wasn't disappointed by this one, whereas I have been by a few of his other stuff. Uh, and, I, and I think it's interesting with him because really, um, for me, it comes down to the theme. Like, it doesn't matter when he wrote the book. My enjoyment will be based more upon the theme. And uh, here, like, this theme of denial and this guy's got, like, clear mental health problems. He's also got, like, some kind of learning dif uh, difficulty. He's been sexually abused. So, um, yeah, they're quite dark themes and definite trigger warnings and stuff. But they're, they're kind of topics I find enjoyable for some dark reason I guess. So overall I gave it like a pretty solid like 3.754 out of 5. Okay. okay guys I've just got two books to update you on here. The first is Black Sunday by Thomas Harris. So he is the author of the Hannibal books um, and yeah this is I think he's also got a new one that was, came out maybe two three years ago that I haven't read as, as well but 
other than that new one and this one. I've read all of his um, Hannibal books, and that's all that he has out. So I'm trying to tick everything off. I've had this for about three years now. It's Again, I've been trying to slowly cut down on my TBR pile. So, um, yeah, like I finally got to this after having this for a while and, and not reading it. I guess my main problem with this was it was about like a terrorist attack at the Super Bowl, but it was written in 1975. And so, so much has changed in the world since then. Like this is from a pre 9-11 world, you know, so it's a bit weird reading a terrorist book from a pre 9-11 world because you can't really like tie it back to what we see in our own world today if that makes sense um it was also kind of dull to be honest i mean it was fair enough for what it was i think it's just i wasn't particularly in the mood for it and when i got through it, i mean i did whiz through it that's the saving grace really is, is that it was quite uh, fast to get through the uh, pacing was a bit off though like the ending of it it just ends suddenly it's like a like a car going into a wall or something where it just suddenly stops and it's like oh okay uh so overall i gave it like a 2.75 maybe three out of five um yeah, probably wouldn't recommend it unless you've read all of Thomas Harris's other books. So I am aware that it's May, but um, this is just, I've been getting people to pick books that correspond, I've been getting people to pick numbers that correspond with uh, the books on my wish list. And somebody picked this one out, so I ordered it and, and read it. And actually, I really enjoyed it. I've probably read about four Dr. Seuss books now, and I think this is, might even be my favourite. And I don't really like Christmas. In fact, I have been called a Grinch which may in part be part of the reason for it, but um, like the wordplay and stuff as well, I just I really enjoyed it, and uh, I gave it a little four out of five. Um, yeah, I don't know, I might even keep this book. I've never seen any of the movie adaptations either, like The Grinch has just totally passed me by, again, because I'm not really into Christmas, so it's kind of cool that I was able to kind of experience it firsthand with the, with the source material. So I gave this one a four out of five, and would recommend it, just probably not in May slash June. Alright guys, just got the one more book to update you on and that is Wilthaven by Ollie Jacobs. So Ollie Jacobs is an indie author. This is kind of, um, well first of all it takes like the form of like a dossier, a bit like the Illuminae Files by uh, Jay Kristoff. Basically it's uh, the Bureau of Paranormal Detectives I believe they're called and they're investigating these strange goings on in this sort of eldritch town called Wilthaven which may or may not exist and um, it's like a small English town with weird stuff going on. So, for example, I think at one point it rains limbs from the sky, although I was chatting to Ollie and he can't remember that bit and he wrote the thing, so maybe I imagined it. But uh, overall, yeah, really did enjoy this. This was for Todd Dane, indie read-along. I gave it a solid 4.25 out of 5 and a full review of this will be coming soon. So there you have it, that's what I read this month, so as always, don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.